thanks for the introduction. Uh, so as uh, introduction, I uh, am a computer scientist. So I work on algorithms, on developing algorithms, which is run on computers, to solve different problems. And I'll generally talk about a class of problems today, uh, which I call similarity search. And uh, let me introduce the problem. Uh, and this is, this is one instance of a problem uh, where we're given a database of images. And this is just a few images taken from a database, uh, a very popular database nowadays called ImageNet. Um, there are many more images than here. And the question here is finding similar images. Right? You want to cluster, you want to find all the pictures that have uh, rivers or oceans or animals. And the question is how to find all the pairs of similar images. OK, so I guess one question that uh, you know, I should discuss is to say, how should we measure similarities of given to images? How do, we actually discuss, how do we actually decide whether they are similar or not? And I'll talk about this on the next slide. Uh, but think about this as given to images, we, we will decide some way to de uh, on a, some measure, some algorithm procedure to decide whether they're similar or not. What I care more about here is we're having a lot of these images. How do we find similar images? And there is a clear, naive solution, uh, namely take all pairs of images and, uh, and compare them. Okay, and decide whether they're similar or not. And if they're similar, then this is your output. Okay, so in computer science speak, we will say that this is n squared comparisons where n is the number of images. Okay, and uh, just to kind of give you a sense of these numbers, you know, these images perhaps are not too, too large. Maybe they're, let's say, 20 by 20 pixels, but n can be very large. So clear, today's databases will have, let's say, a billion of images. So n, think about this as a billion. Okay, and uh, you know, something like n for a billion, n squared, so this is a billion times a billion, this, you know, no matter how you do your comparisons, if you spend some time doing those comparisons, this is just becomes a humongous number. Okay? And uh, this is, I mean, more kind of problematically, if you have these images, let's say, even stored on one computer or many computers, this means that uh, you, your computation is much, much larger than the data set that you have. Okay, and this is a problem. This is usually, we cannot afford such solutions. Okay, and uh, the main question that kind of I'll be talking today is how do we do, uh, how can we do better? Okay, and uh, I should start with kind of disclaimers. So, you know, this is a kind of computer science talk. It is about algorithms, but I'll try to understand that most of you are not computer scientists, so I'll try to kind of keep it to the minimum, the computer science part, kind of the algorithms part, and introducing the ideas as necessary. And I'll mostly kind of try to focus on the theoretical ideas here, so on mathematical ideas and how do we connect to math and to geometry in particular. Okay, all right, so let's go. Um, all right, so how do we measure similarity? Okay, so let me take kind of, uh, you know, some simple images. These are kind of images from another data set called MNIST of handwritten images and you want to recognize them. And how do we say measure kind of, how do we see whether images are uh, similar or not? So one kind of, you know, the first approach, you know, you can imagine is take an image and uh, let's say if it's six by six pixels, then uh, we can associate a coordinate or a number to each pixel uh, so such an image, uh, okay, good one. Uh, so an image here can be represented by kind of a sequence of zeros and ones where, you know, zero represents that there is kind of no pixel here and one represents that there is a pixel here. Okay, and, uh, uh, and let's say, you know, an image here it is, let's say if it's six by six pixels, then it will be, let's say, six by uh, six, so 36 such numbers. Okay, and uh, basically what we've done is we've taken these objects, which are images in this situation, and we represent in them what is called high dimensional vectors. Okay, so now, you know, we don't really care that this is kind of two by two, but mostly that it is a sequence of 36 bits. And uh, this is a high dimensional vector where kind of each, each such bit is one dimension, and it's high dimensional because we have each object is represented by many such numbers. Okay, so we've represented kind of, you know, this is how we start connecting to geometry. And, uh, you know, once we define such high dimensional vectors, uh, we can talk about uh, the similarity or dissimilarity between such vectors. Right, so now we can measure similarity between two such images just by computing the distance between this set of bits and this set of bits. Okay, and um, in this situation, as I uh, as, this, as shown here, it will be uh, Hamming distance, or what is called Hamming space. So our vectors will be 
uh, from the alphabet of 0, 1 and of length d. Okay? And the way we measure the distance is by Hamming distance. So we look at these two vectors and compare how many, how many bits are different here. Okay? D is the 36. D is 36, yes, thank you. Okay, yes, excellent. Um, yes, feel free to ask questions, especially if something is not clear. Uh, okay, but I mean, this is one way, this is a naive way, uh, and there are many more kind of fancier ways where you take these images and plug them through some you know, black boxes, and you get, let's say, vectors, uh, and you say Euclidean vectors of dimension D, and you measure the distance using Euclidean distance. Okay, and usually the dimension will be high here. Um, so, uh, I mean, these black boxes kind of originally they were like very manufactured by hand. Nowadays, these black boxes will be neural nets. I'm sure most of you have heard about deep learning. Uh, but at the end of the day, almost all such methods will output some kind of vectors. They are usually high dimensional. Um, you know, Euclidean distance perhaps is the most common one, and this is actually the one that I'll focus mostly in this talk. Okay. And I should mention that there are kind of much fancier ways to measure similarity between images. So these are some pictures taken from some uh, paper in image vision. Uh, so this is, well, uh, this is my alma mater, Sata Center at MIT. And you want to measure kind of similarity between these two images. So, you know, doing it this way, and if obviously won't work on these images because there is some rotation. Uh, so usually what uh, kind of the approach, kind of uh, one approach to do this is to, defi to determine some kind of interesting parts in the images, this will be these yellow squares. Each of these squares will be represented as vectors, let's say using these kind of methods. And then uh, you'll try to find some kind of matching between these uh, kind of interesting features with these interesting features, and depending on how similar they are, you'll declare whether the images are similar or not. Okay, and mathematically we'll say that this uh, gives us a different uh, geometry or different space. Uh, so here our image is represented by sets of points, these basically yellow things. Uh, and the distance will be what is called Earth mover distance, or in math it's sometimes called uh, Wasserstein distance. Okay, so you know, I'm gonna define it because it won't be interesting for the talk, but just to tell you that there are many such options. Okay, so this is, you know, you've kind of, if you haven't seen before, this is kind of the main, email, the main message that we can map these computational problems into kind of geometrical, geometrical settings. And now we are talking about geometrical questions. Okay, and just to formalize, kind of, this will be the problem that we'll talk about for the rest of the talk, uh, uh, for the rest of the talk, and it's called nearest neighbor search. Okay, so this is mathematical or computer science formalization of the problem that we, that we will solve. It will be a little bit different from before, but uh, we'll connect it. Okay, so it is what we call a data structure question. Uh, so we have kind of two stages. One is pre-processing. So we have a database of points, okay? So think about these points as being already kind of this high dimensional representation of images. Okay, we call it P. And now we're given a query point Q. So this is a new image, right? And uh, you want to find uh, the most similar uh, image to it in the database. For example, you want to do classification, right? So you know already the labels of these images, you know that some of them uh, rivers, some of them are tigers, let's say, and you have a query point and you want to find the similar images. You know, perhaps this will give you a new label for your own query. Okay? And uh, what, you, you know, what we need to do at the query time is to find the point P star, which is the closest to our query point Q. Okay? So again, I'm not specifying what is exactly the distance, but I can think about this Euclidean distance. Okay? And uh, you know, just kind of notation again, n will be number of points for the rest of the talk. I'll, I'll remind this whenever necessary, and d will be the dimension. Okay, so we'll usually think about this as being high dimensional space. So everything as if you do not care about what is the objective for this comparison. It's important not to know what you are going to use it for. What we are using it for, yes. Uh, so, yes, it's true, kind of. Sometimes, um, so the question is, you know, is it important to know what are we doing these comparisons for? What are we, why are we solving? So actually this is kind of the next uh, point is that this, is, this point is a primitive for our many, many other computational problems. So in particular this, is, uh, this data structure is already uh, useful for solving the original problem I'm starting with, with giving a big database, find all similar pairs. Namely how will you do it? You take your database, you construct this data structure, and then 
you query each of the other points and get, you know, perhaps not only one closest point, but a few closest points, and this will give you the most similar pairs of points. So if we can, uh, so if we can do preprocessing very efficiently and the query is very efficient, you know, I'll define what is efficient soon, uh, then we have solved our similar pairs problem efficiently. Okay, but it's also used for many other problems, clustering problems where somehow we want, we have a database and want to partition things into similar things, uh, and many other problems where, uh, which are defined on large sets of multi-feature objects. And if we have a bunch, a bunch of objects, a bunch of images, and, and other, and other things. So it is, sometimes we want to, uh, it is important what problems we're solving later, but in a sense it is kind of when we're approaching these bigger problems, it's good to partition them kind of into, into models which are kind of more efficiently solvable and uh, kind of understand each module separately and then put them uh, things together. So usually the ideas that are done, I mean, even if the algorithms are not used exactly as they are here, usually the ideas that are behind solving this problem can be embedded into the final problem that you want to solve. Right, so this is, this is exactly the problem. So pre-processing is what we do offline. So we prepare for the queries. So think about kind of, let's say, kind of Google example. So you pre-process kind of all the data that you have and then you are ready for the queries. And then the query comes and you need to report it very quickly. Okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll go over kind of naive solutions here and perhaps it will like make things a little bit easier. There is a question in the back. Yes, all the points have the same dimension, let's say. So that's the prerequisite, like, uh, Well, the total number of pixels has to be the same, yes, you normalize. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is an issue, but, you know, we are trying to, like, swipe it under the cover at the moment. Okay, and I should mention, kind of, like, in terms of applications, uh, you know, this is, you know, already alluded to, but it has many applications in kind of recognition tasks, for example, speech. Uh, so these points perhaps are representations of uh, transcripts of speech or kind of vocal cords uh, or images, videos, music, music rec recognition, signal processing, bioinformatics. And just to mention kind of when I was at Microsoft, some of my, uh, at Microsoft Research, some of my kind of two problems that, you know, or two applications that I have seen kind of my own eyes because my colleagues were working on them is when these points were representations of code. So, you know, Microsoft has kind of the issue or perhaps had the issue that uh, there is a big code base and some of the code is replicated. So you want to find this code, the pieces of the code that are replicated and how to do this quickly. You cannot compare each kind of piece of code with some other piece of code. So this was like well, problem one. Another problem that I've seen is for video recognition where there is, um, imagine kind of putting an overlay on the TV and the TV immediately recognizes what kind of channel is playing just by uh, checking it against a database of all the channels that it knows. Uh, so in a sense, kind of the focus here is on high dimensional vectors. So usually, for example, in speech recognition, you can think about quantizing, taking all the speech, quantizing into small pieces and each of these pieces is a different feature. So this is why it's multidimensional. Okay, so let me start with some, you know, preamble. And this is kind of almost the only kind of computer science part of this talk. Uh, so suppose we solve a much simpler task, namely we want to check for exact match, okay? Uh, so there is no, we want, so we have a database of images, let's say, or objects, points in particular, and we want to say, is there, given a query, is there already an object which is exactly the same as our given object in the database? Okay, and how do we solve this problem? Okay, and uh, you know, the, the idea is you know, something that perhaps you know, if you think about this in the way you, know, you have, let's say, a bunch of books and you want to organize them in, in your library uh, so that later you can find a particular book very quickly, how you do, you'll just sort the books. Right? So you'll have books in sorted order kind of by their name and if you want to find a particular book, you just, you know, go, uh, you do what is called binary search. Okay, so let me just say kind of what do you mean by, sir, by sort. Well, we have, uh, let's say kind of this is, uh, if we kind of order these uh, vectors kind of, like if we, if we look at the vectors and we, have a kind of comparison between these two vectors because let's say this is, this is only zeros, this has some ones, so this goes to the left of this. You can think about this as sorting books with alphabet which is zero, one and a fixed length of a name. 
Okay, so then you know if you come you know in the center and uh, you you have for example an image which is all once you know that you can compare it to the middle here you know that it will be to the right. So if you know the basic idea or basic analogy is that if you have books in sorted order it is much much faster to find the book that you want than if your books were completely arbitrary order. So this is the idea. And you know, just to you know, write down the algorithm, the processing will be to sort the points. And the query is what is called binary search. You know, so it is how you would expect to, to look for a book in, uh, let's say, in an index. Okay? And um, you know, I, I won't discuss this kind of too much, but uh, kind of in computer science speak, what we'll say is that the space is order n. Right? So we don't really need to store any other information like except for actual order of our books. And this will take space order n. And the query time will be order log n. So it will be exponentially smaller than, uh, than n. So I won't describe this, you know, uh, hopefully many of you have seen this, but you know, that's, that's the idea. Yes, question? So in a sense, you sort first by the first bit, okay. okay. Then you sort by the second bit, and so forth. And for example, by the third bit, this this book kind of or this image should be to the right of all these which you have zero in the same position here, right? And the order between, let's say, these two is that this one appears uh, there is in position I guess eight. There is a one here and a zero here. So this one has kind of later in the alphabetical order. The third bit is the most important, and so forth. Question? Yes, we can hash, but I avoided talking about hashing because it's, it's a computer science notion. Yes, we can also do hashing, absolutely. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll think about this solution as we'll come back to the solution as indexing, basically. Okay, so you can think about this. You know, rather than sorting the books, you just store everything in an index, let's say, and an index will tell you exactly where to go to look for a book. And another kind of another observation here is that exactly the same solution already works for nearest neighbor search, where we think about our vectors as being one-dimensional Euclidean, num uh, one-dimensional real numbers. Okay, so if we have, let's say, this is the real line, this is our one dimension, uh, and uh, this is our data set of seven points, then if we want to find number, uh, we want to find, let's say, uh, number four, and we say, what is the closest point to the number four, then we don't need to compare to each of these numbers to seven. We can, we can do the binary search, namely binary search will say, let's go to the center, compare to this number, is it to the left or to the right? So four is left, to the left, so we go here, so we know it is exactly, it should be one of these should be the solution. Um, so when we compare to two, four is bigger than two, so we know that it should be somewhere here. Okay, and then we compare to 3.5. Okay, and these are the only numbers that we have to compare, and when we compare to three numbers as opposed to seven. This is why this is log n. Okay, so this is, this is for exact match. Okay, so what can we do in the high dimensional case? And let me kind of, you know, for simplicity, focus at the moment on this uh, Hamming space uh, case. Okay, and again, just to give you kind of a sense of the numbers, and these are kind of not atypical numbers, is that our n, the number of uh, objects or images, will be a billion, and the dimension will be, let's say, 400. This will roughly correspond, let's say, to a 20 by 20 uh, pixel images. Okay, so, and kind of a naive algorithm is to do nothing basically, to do no indexing, no, no pre-processing. Uh, and uh, you know, think about this as this is the underprepared solution. Right? So we say we are completely lazy, we don't do anything at the beginning. And whenever we have an object, we just scan through the entire database, we compare to every potential image. Right? So and this is why our query time will be linear in, N, in the number of images. Okay, so this is the underprepared case. And there is also the, uh, the overprepared ca uh, prepared case. We say, uh, so we'll try to do everything to prepare for all possible queries. Okay, so if there is an image which has exactly that particular sequence of zeros and ones, we write an answer. What should be the image that we should answer in that situation? Right, what is the closest image from our database that, uh, that is closest? 
And here the query time will be small, kind of. We, you know, basically we just have to read the image, right? This is order D. Okay? The space, unfortunately, will be exponential in D because it says we need to prepare, we need to write down, let's say, in, in our computer, uh, the answer for every possible for every possible image, and there are basically, you know, two to the power d such uh, possible images. Okay, and you know, this is why I put these numbers. You know, obviously this becomes unaffordable, you know, for d let's say equals to a 400. But in general, kind of, uh, this is unaffordable if d is bigger than log n. And in some sense, this is kind of this is a particular phenomenon. This is this is a particular uh, barrier where things begin to change. Okay, and we'll think about d as being bigger than log n. This is kind of mathematically speaking. Um, this is what we hold the high dimensional case. Okay, but you know, just you know, looking at the numbers, you know, like when your d is 400, then probably you're in high dimensional case. Okay, so you know, so what can we do? You know, so the question is, okay, can we do the best indexing? You know, is there our solution in between these two things? Uh, can you know, the best indexing would be something which has space, which is Linear in our database, so it is you know linear in the number of images times the size of each image, and we want only kind of that our indexing the query time works in time which is proportional to the size of an image, okay? Or you know even you know let alone the best possible indexing, even a little better indexing, right? So this is something which is basically we think as being sublinear in the size of a database. So can we have a solution which doesn't have to read the entire, the entire database? And space is you know, not too bad, let's say, even let's say quadratic. I mean, you know, this is not ideal, but even that, um, can we achieve even this kind of solution? And it turns out that this is, uh, you know, to the best of our knowledge, which is not achievable. Okay, as long as the dimension is much bigger than long, than log n. And this is what is called the curse of dimensionality. Or think about this as the curse of high dimensionality. Okay, and the formal statement is that uh, if we were able to achieve such an algorithm, that would refute uh, you know, a very strong version of a popular conjecture called P versus MP. This is kind of the main conjecture in computer science. Um, and this is the result uh, by Ryan Williams uh, more than a decade ago. Okay, so this is the status. And uh, you know what? You know, given this situation, what can we do now? Okay. So the you know what kind of the research community has has done, and this is kind of dates back to uh, to the nineties, is to say, okay, let's try to relax the problem a little bit. Okay. So perhaps we don't want to find kind of to solve the problem absolutely exactly, uh, but we'll we'll do we'll solve what we call approximate nearest neighbor. Okay. So uh, so let me define kind of so first I'll define what is now, if you notice, it's you know near neighbor. So let me define first what is a near neighbor, and then I'll define approximate near neighbor problem. Okay, so this is uh, this is a variation, and you know sometimes this is a variation that you actually want to solve from the beginning. It says that rather than finding the exact nearest neighbor, uh, it will set up a threshold which we called R near neighbor, and we say as long as the point is within distance R, it is an okay answer. So let me do this pictorially. We have the query, and we say we set a threshold r, and we're saying anything which is within distance r is an okay answer. So either of these two points is an okay answer. So everything in this grid ball is okay, and this red ball is a not okay answer. Okay, so think about this, you know, the difference is rather than finding the most similar object in the database, we are okay to find an object which is considered just similar. Okay, for some threshold of similarity. Okay, so again, kind of this thing will be considered as similar, and this red outskirts is considered not similar. Okay, so this is not the approximate version yet. And now we introduce the approximate version. And the approximate version introduces another parameter C. Okay, and think about this as kind of a factor two, let's say C approximate, let's say, you know, factor two approximate. And what it does, it introduces this gray area. Okay, you know, as, as always in life, nothing is red or white, oh, sorry, well, red or green or black or white. Uh, there is always a gray area, right? And this is, this is the gray area that we'll have. Uh, so in a sense, whatever lies in this gray area is kind of similar and it can go either way. 
Okay, depending on the success of the algorithm, it can sometimes be considered as similar, sometimes it will be considered as not similar. Okay, and formally we'll define the problem as, uh, as if there is something in this green ball, if there is some similar points, it should be okay to report something which is either in this green ball, which is basically similar, or something which is kind of similar. Okay, so this is, this is the definition of the problem. And uh, C is bigger than one, yes, thank you. Right, so this is C is bigger than one. I did not write, yes, I, I, I'll miss some parts. It's in the, yeah, but uh, it's not obvious. But, uh, but yes, C is bigger than one, thank you, yes. But, but probably I should have mentioned this from the beginning. Uh, and for the rest of the talk, we'll think of C as being equal to two. Okay, this is one particular number bigger than one. Um, so in practice, in practice, kind of approximate version is kind of a peculiar version, and you know some people kind of will agree with it, and some people will disagree. You know, do we really want something which is roughly similar or not? Uh, but it can actually be used. So in practice, the algorithms, whatever algorithms you get from solving this problem, can be used to solve the exact near neighbor as well. In particular, those algorithms will return a bunch of points, which include all the points in this green ball and perhaps some in this gray uh, annulus as well. Okay, so then you can, you can think about this as a filtering sy system, which basically returns you a bunch of points which mostly consist of similar things, but perhaps also some which are kind of in the gray area. And you can filter them out. You can kind of go through these points and filter out the ones that you don't like. Okay, so uh, also kind of one, uh, one part which will be important is that all these algorithms or most of the algorithms that we'll talk about will be randomized. So whenever we return a solution, we return a solution with probability 90%, let's say. This can be played with or can be amplified, uh, but just kind of, kind of keep, in, keep in mind that you know, it will all, not always succeed. It will succeed you know, most of the time. So each point will be uh, returned with good probability. And this can be played with, but yes, question? Yes, yes. So this is, there are slightly different versions where we report a point or return all points which are in this green ball. And usually the algorithms that I'll talk about can solve either version. So I don't really want to discuss about this because it doesn't introduce any new ideas. Yes. In a real world implementation, does the, you're assuming translation and variances. Does that cause like major problems in the real world or is it kind of something that can be okay? Uh, so it, um, it depends, I mean, uh, it depends how, how it parses the question. So usually, yes, I mean, this is translation invariant, okay? Uh, if you don't have translation invariance, in some sense you can embed this or kind of encode this into your distance. Okay, so uh, we will just define the distance and distance can be translation, in, I mean, not invariant, let's say, if, if this is important for application. Okay, so this is in a sense, all these kind of aspects are hidden in the definition of the distance. Uh, yes, so, and oops, and this leads exactly to the last point here, is that this requires a threshold to be set at the beginning, but at least, I mean, oftentimes in practice that is okay. Uh, in theory, uh, or theoretically, we can actually use, if we solve this problem, we can also solve the nearest neighbor, the approximate nearest neighbor, using this as a primitive as well. Okay, so therefore I'll talk only about this thresholded version. You mean R equals one? R, we can think of, so in the Euclidean space, we can think about R as being equal to one because we can always rescale things, that's true. Uh, what I'm, uh, here it is the discussion is slightly different is that we're solving nearest neighbor as opposed to the uh, near neighbor. So there is no threshold in nearest problem. We don't have a threshold at the beginning. This is the first problem I define. We are saying, find me the point which is the closest. So I really want this P star as opposed to this one, which is a little bit further away. Okay. Okay. Nearest, yeah. Nearest or K nearest, yes. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so this is kind of all set up. This is like problem definition. Let me tell you uh, a little bit about uh, algorithms. And this is, 
I mean, in a sense, you know, so far we talked about kind of geometry, but you know, relatively at the basic level, where we said, okay, let's define things as points, as vectors, and we have a distance, and so forth. We didn't really use the properties of the geometry of the space. Okay, and now we'll talk about the algorithm. So this is uh, this is the method and approach uh, called local sensitive hashing, and you know, I'll explain later why it is called this way, introduced by Indik Matwani from '98, and which has had a lot of impact on this problem since. Okay, and uh, the main idea here is what we'll do is, in a sense, we'll try to reduce our problem of similarity search to the exact match problem for which I, you know, we've talked about this indexing solution, this library solution, right? So the idea is just how about to reduce the problem, you know, the new problem you have to the one we know how to solve, okay? So the idea will be to map points into some codes, into some names, okay, such that the notion of similar for points uh, will be equivalent to the notion of exact match in codes. Okay, so we want to assign, so I'll define this more formally in a bit, but this is the intuitive idea. This is the main idea of this. Okay, so I mean, I, I'll show this geometrically, so what, what these things mean. This blob always will represent our Euclidean space. I know it doesn't exactly look like high dimensional, but imagine that this is a projection of 400, 400 dimensional Euclidean space. Okay, as much as I can draw in PowerPoint. Um, and uh, so the assigning points to codes is equivalent to a partitioning of a space. Okay, how so? So you can, so this is a partitioning of a Euclidean space. All these points, right, uh, which are in this connected part, are all the points which are assigned the same code. Okay, they're all, so this is kind of a naming procedure, and all these points have been given the same name, right? All these points have the same name, different from this one. Okay, so formally, it is a map uh, which maps, uh, say, d dimensional Euclidean space into some names, okay, discrete names, such that for any points P and Q, we have the following properties. Okay, there should be some points. Uh, so given two points which are similar, Okay. Remember, similar for us means that it is less than this threshold of similarity. Okay. We want that their names are equal. Okay. This is what it means here. Um, so what, and what we want for the similar pairs is that, you know, again, the similar pair means that the uh, points are at, at the sec second threshold, right? At the bigger threshold, they are bigger. We want that their names are different. Okay, so suppose, you know, as I already suggested, this is not quite possible, but suppose we would live in the world where this is possible. So, you know, once we have this, you know, just to make sure, you know, what we can do this is we can just use the indexing solution on these names of our points for all the points in the data set. Okay, so pictorially, let's say we have these three points in our database. Um, we do, the, we take this partition. Uh, this nice partition having these properties. And basically we write down all these uh, names, let's say, and for each name we store kind of, this will be a bucket uh, for all the points that fall into this part or all the points that have the same name, right? And let's say we just store and we do indexing on these names, okay? So when a query, uh, query uh, queue comes, we just look up the bucket with, you know, associated with the name of this code and all the points that are stored here are exactly the points which are similar, uh, similar to our point, uh, query point Q. Okay, so this would be ideal. Now, this is not possible. Okay, and this is kind of geometrically, it's very, you know, it should be intuitively kind of to see, but this is not quite possible because, you know, there is, there is a border and it is possible to put one point at one side of the border and another point on the other side of the border. So they are exactly separated by this border. Yes, you can prove that this is not possible, yes. For, for no distance. Uh, so yes, for many threshold R and C bigger than one. Sorry? For no distance. Uh, yeah, you have to be a little bit careful with distance. I mean, because perhaps some distances will be defined to precisely satisfy this code. But as long as, you know, for most reasonable distances, you can prove this. For anything we care about, this is not possible. Okay, so we cannot do this, and because of that, what we'll have, well, what we'll have to do is we'll introduce the notion of a randomized map. So determining such partition is not possible. So what we'll do, we'll do, uh, we'll introduce randomization here. Okay, so now this map G is somehow randomized. 
and we'll see some examples on the next slide how we randomize this kind of things. Um, such that the following property holds. So this is not a deterministic procedure, but it is something that holds with some probability now. Okay, and we'll see that the probability that these codes are equal is not too low. Let's say, and this condition will uh, you know will uh, replace with something which is, uh, which says that probability that the codes of these two points which are uh, far of this dissimilar pair is low. Okay, so uh, let me just introduce this uh, uh, to show a picture. So think about this as our G will be randomized. Okay, and we'll see examples. Uh, and we'll think about this as uh, this is, we can draw a graph of the probability that two points have the same name. This is probability over the choice of our randomized map G. Uh, as a function of the distance between our two points, and this is some decreasing function. Okay, so it starts at one, so for you know, same points always has the same name of itself, but eventually it kind of drops off. Decreasing. Sorry? Decreasing. Strictly decreasing, let's say. Right, so this is a general discussion. We'll talk about concrete methods in a bit. Okay, so now in a sense there is, you know, the, the, there is some probability that we will not find our similar pair. So this will require from us to build a bunch of such indexes, okay? So we'll not build just one index, we'll build several indexes, or geometrically speaking, this will not be just one such partition, but will be a bunch of such partitions. Um, so vectorially, we'll take kind of a few experiments, right? A few such partitions. So maybe, maybe this is another randomized partition, we build index for it. Uh, we take another randomized partition, we build an index for it. We take another in, uh, randomized partition and we build uh, an index for it, right? So each of these kind of tables or each of these indexes uses a new map G which is randomized, okay? So this is kind of the default solution. This is kind of our baseline solution, okay? And of course, kind of, you know, how many indexes do we need to, to build? Right, if we need an exponential number of indexes or super many indexes, this is not a good solution. So we need to talk about how many indexes do we need. And of course, it depends on how exactly these probabilities look like. And it turns out that it depends only on two, on kind of on two probabilities or two points from this graph. Namely, the probability, which we call P1, of the, uh, that these names collide, it's like they're in the same bucket, uh, at distance r, and this probability, this low probability, which we call p2, which is a distance here. Okay, and you know, I'll just kind of throw a formula. You know, we won't discuss it. You know, it's more kind of a proof of the existence of a formula. Um, so uh, the number of indexes that you need is uh, n to power rho. So it is, it will be a function of the size of the database. Again, n is the number of points. Where rho, think about rho, is the main parameter of the quality of the partition. Right? This is what governs how, uh, you know, it, it is a function of how well did we partition the space, and it governs our runtime. So it depends on this P1 and P2. Um, if you think a little bit through it, then you'll see that rho is always less than one. So the number of indexes is smaller than the number of points. Okay? And, um, and you know this is kind of this is the base solution. And now the remaining question is how to construct good maps from here. How to construct randomized maps G at this moment? Okay. So here is uh, so here is kind of map one. Uh, this is not quite the first one, but it was introduced. But you know it is perhaps the simplest to explain. Uh, so it is. It, we call it random grid, uh, and it's due to data Rindic, uh, Imurlika, and Mirokni. And this is how it goes. So this is our, again, this is our Euclidean space. Um, let's say we have a bunch of points there. So the idea is the following. This is the map G. What we do is we partition our space using a regular grid. Okay, this is how a regular grid looks like. Okay, there are a few parameters that we talked about, you know, what is the width for the cell and so forth. You know, let's ignore all this and just focus on the ideas. Uh, so the idea is to take this grid. Okay, so taking, just taking the grid, again, is not useful. Somehow we need to use this randomization here. And, uh, you, know, one, you know, one part of randomization is first to randomly shift it. This is how it will look like. 
Okay? So this is, turns out still not to be enough. So what you can do is also, uh, what you need to do is to also randomly rotate it. Okay? So you rotate the, the partition. And now this gives us a partition of Euclidean space. Again, all the points which are in the same cell will be mapped to the same code, to the same name. Okay? And now, you know, it is kind of a matter of writing down formulas and some calculations to see what is our quality of this partition, right? So with some probabilities of uh, the two points remain in the same cell after uh, imposing this random, uh, random grid and so forth, okay? And at the end of the day, you can, you know, go through kind of the previous slide and this slide, and at the end of the day, what you'll get is that we can get a solution for nearest neighbor search, and kind of this is the first solution for high dimensional uh, space, where our space will be n to power one plus rho, again, rho is this quality, uh, time is n to power rho, where rho is a function of our approximation. Okay, and again, uh, our approximation c equals two, um, you know, just as an example, this exponent will be a half. Okay, so, you know, if you've seen, for example, coding theory, think about this rho as kind of the, the capacity, kind of. Um, so, you know, it has similar meaning. Um, you know, the, the smaller the rho, the better it will be here. Um, and this means that our runtime will be roughly, let's say, root n, and the space will be, let's say, n to 1.5. Okay, C is the approximation, right? So this is, there are two thresholds between what it means to be similar and dissimilar, right? And in between, kind of, it's kind of, right? It's the gray area, okay? So this is, you know, this is what we got. And the question now is, you know, can we do better, right? So this is kind of, you know, we put kind of our optimization hat and say, okay, good, we have an algorithm, it does something, can we do even better here? And it, so for, for improving rho, right? So, so what, you know, all our algorithms will look like this, kind of. Uh, they are all parameterized by this rho, right? This was kind of a previous slide. It was like an approach. It didn't talk about any particular metric space or anything. It says that there is a quality of a space partition. It is quantified by one parameter called rho. We want rho as small as possible because it decreases both the space and the query time. And so far we got some exponent. This is a formula C. And for approximation two is at a half. It's a half. Can we do better than this? Okay. So let me uh, let me show you kind of a different approach. And this is uh, based on uh, what we call uh, ball carving. So this is back from uh, joint work with Peter Ending in 2006. And this is how it goes. And this is, I mean, this is already kind of using more geometric intuition now. And the idea is the following. So far, what we partition the space into is into this regular grid, okay? So the idea, you know, the, the basic idea here is to replace this regular grid with a grid of balls, okay? So instead of partitioning the space into this, we partition into, into balls. It's not a partition, precisely, thank you. Uh, so uh, this is the next part, uh, again, you know, if it were to be a partition, so we have a point P, we look in which ball it is, each of these ball has its name, you know, that will be the coding, but uh, P can uh, hit empty space, right? So we cannot, you know, be, if we were, this is called tessellation, kind of, uh, partitioning the space into balls, this is not possible even in dimension two. And um, so this means that if, if we take a grid of such balls, there will be lots of empty space. And the higher we go in the dimension, the more empty space there is actually. Okay, so this means that we need to take more such grids. Okay, and you know, what we do in this situation, you know, picture is worth a thousand words, so I'll just kind of show you what happens in dimension 2D. And you know, this is where the name of ball carving comes from. So impose one such grid of balls, right? Each of these balls has its own name, its own code. We take another grid, right? It carves out the remaining part of the set. Again, each, uh, each of these balls will have its own name, and so forth until we cover the entire space. So each of these connected colored parts has its own name, has its own code. And this is the partitioning that we take. Okay, again, this, uh, this grid will be randomly shifted, randomly rotated, let's say, uh, but this is the idea. Okay, and uh, so there is one kind of technical issue, so I'll quickly just uh, glance over it, namely, how many grids do we need here? 
And uh, there is uh, an issue that if you cover the space in this way, and you do take as many grids as necessary to cover the entire space, it turns out that the number of grids of balls that you need will be exponential in the dimension. Yes. We need walls which don't overlap. If so, think about okay, this. So yes. Yeah, so we we take a grid. Yes. Each of these each of these uh, ball is a different name. Is a different code. And, and then you will add non -round balls, or yeah. And we take a, more such grids, and each of them will basically carve out the remaining part of the space. Think about this as somebody kind of eating up the space, right? So, for example, the last ones with uh, I guess purple color. You know, we'll take a smaller part of the space, but yeah, that, that's how that's how it will look like. And the number, it is important that the balls don't uh, don't interact kind of in one grid because if you take balls and kind of grow them out, then this essentially becomes grids. Right, so if you take balls and we say uh, we take them so that we overlap and then we kind of partition them in the natural way, that you know which point is uh, closest to which center of a ball. There is a radius large enough of these balls such that what we get is actually a grid. So it is, in a sense, it is important that these, in one grid, these balls don't overlap. Okay. So how many grids do we need? Uh, it turns out that we need exponential dimension. So this is an issue. This means that, in a sense, our map is described has, you know, just to describe this map, we need to take so many grids that it is exponential in the dimension, it is kind of back to the original problem that we start, we try to run away with, namely being exponential in the dimension. Again, think of dimension as being 400. Clement? Why do you need such a small space and not the bigger balls because you're going to uh, It's a uh, good question. We still, you know, you can see that even to cover the points, most of the space, let's say half of the space, you still need about this many grids. Okay, it is not, it is not that, we are trying to cover the last piece of space that's, uh, that we need so many grids. It is even to cover a reasonable fraction of the space, we need very many grids. Right, so, uh, right, so this is very similar to Clement's question. We don't need to cover, but this, is, this, this bound is even to cover a reasonable fraction of the space, even to cover, let's say, 10% of the space. Okay. So, uh, so there is kind of a, a technical part that uh, you know, I'll, I'll just glance over, is that what you can do is, rather than doing uh, this partitioning in the original space, what you do is you do what is called random projection. So you take a random subspace of dimension t, you project the points into that subspace, and you do this partitioning that subspace. Okay? So, you know, I know this is technical, and probably this will, you know, uh, this will be kind of, you know, more math than kind of you, know, you expected, perhaps. Uh, so I'll just, you know, kind of show you for, you know, for those of you who can follow. Uh, so we can do this, and you know, then there is a question of uh, how do we choose this dimension t? And it turns out that it is a trade-off between two things. One is that this parameter, our quality rho, gets closer to the bound, to the best bound uh, for higher dimension t. So we want this t to be as high as possible here. On the other hand, the number of grids that we need is you know, exponential in t. This is kind of by the same bound. And you can balance these things out and, and so forth. Uh, at the end of the day, and you know, ign ignore this dimension reduction if you, if you don't follow, but at the end of the day, we get again space and time, which is of the same form, looks uh, the same form as on the previous slide. But now our row, the quality of the exponent is much better. It is now tens to one quarter. Uh, one quarter. Right, so we improved, so this, this is a kind of a naturally better way to partition the space, Euclidean space. It, it gives us this quality, which is a quarter. So this means that our uh, runtime improved from what was n to a half on the previous slide, on the previous partition, uh, to n to a quarter. Yeah, so we, we are hiding some factors, and you know, just kind of for the it was. Sorry. Right. 
So yeah, let, let me cover this kind of later on, just because there are more things to be done kind of here. This is kind of the simplest way, and I just want to focus on the geometric part in a sense. Sir, what, did you explain why you don't take the, 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 the lattice and the, and the distance for which this lattice is, is made of both? Absolutely. So another solution, and again, kind of this is kind of more advanced kind of ideas, is to rather than taking these balls, these partitions in balls, it is possible to take certain kind of lattices. But those lattices have to be very nice lattices, and unfortunately, we don't uh, we don't know we don't really know how to deal with those lattices, which are very nice in terms of partitioning the space. So I, I can talk about this perhaps kind of at the, end, at the end of the talk because it's a little bit longer discussion. And these are actually where some of the most interesting related problems that are remaining here is exactly kind of finding lattices where each cell of a, of a lattice looks like a ball, but it still has very nice decoding properties, if you wish. Oh. So, uh, so actually, this, so this will be on the next slide. So let, let me just get there. If there is another question. Wait, so when uh, the more sophisticated version of the reduction system and dimension to the johnson lenny strauss transform? Yes, this will be johnson lenny strauss dimension reduction. OK, so kind of going on. Um, OK, so one slide is on. Um, on connections. So it turns out that similar space partitions are quite ubiquitous in computer science and mathematics. And just to kind of mention a few other areas where similar uh, space partitions have been used successfully is in approximation algorithms, so kind of on graph algorithms, uh, on spectral graph partitioning, on spherical cubes, on metric embeddings, um, and communication complexity, and many, many places. So these kind of space partitions related to ball carving are quite ubiquitous and have been quite powerful in getting many other algorithms. OK, so, uh, so coming back kind of to the question of getting this best row, right? This was our goal, kind of, OK, how can we do with space partitions that gets the best quality partition? OK, so this is what I kind of mentioned so far. This was the first solution, kind of random grids. This is this ball carving solution that gets better quality uh, for row. And the question is, you know, is there even better LSH map? Can we get, get with this partition, partition the space even better than this ball carving? OK, and it turns out that no. OK, so this is, uh, so this line of work started with work uh, by Asaf Noor here, uh, together with Matwani and Panigrahi, and it was kind of completed by O'Donnell, Wu, and Zhu. Uh, and uh, we showed that this bound that, you know, was obtained kind of by this ball carving is actually tight. Right, if you want to partition this map uh, with these properties, this is the best we can do. Okay, and this is uh, kind of you know this is where kind of interesting connections kind of to deep geometry or deep functional analysis appear, because this lower bound kind of this impossibility result is an example of uh, what is called as a parametric inequality, and you know just to kind of explain kind of in, in simpler terms what it means. Uh, you know, an example of isoparametric inequality, or kind of like one of the kind of most classic examples of uh, such as a parametric inequality, is to ask the following question. So consider bodies, or kind of convex bodies, some, some objects, let's say, in d-dimensional space, which have fixed volume, let's say volume one, which of these bodies will have the lowest perimeter or periphery? Right, so what is the answer? Well, sorry? Here, yes, well, yeah, uh, right. So this is, so this is kind of, you know, that's not exactly, you know, what has been used here, but it's a very related question, right? And this is why kind of partitioning Euclidean space in these spheres is the best. Yes, precisely, exactly, right. So in a sense, uh, fixing the, the volume one is roughly corresponds to fixing the probability that dissimilar pairs have the same no, uh, name. Kind of, or collide under this map G. And uh, the similar pairs, the probability that the similar pairs are uh, separated is exactly related to this, to this boundary, right? Because this boundary is what is bad for us. Kind of. right? So we want to minimize the, the perimeter, yes. When you say subspace T, is it just a random subspace? Absolutely. Is it, like I would think logically you would want the subspace that gets you like maximal separation among your training points, which would probably be like some Eigenvectors, right. Uh, uh, not, yes, computing the eigenvectors to 
No, no, no. So it is um, right. So this is this goes into. Uh, but that's, that's a good question, kind of, and I I kind of miss kind of or decided not to talk about the solutions, mostly because so I'm focusing on the solutions for which we can prove certain guarantees. Okay, uh, so there are solutions, and uh, in fact I think I'll mention them some some of them on the next slide where uh, they are slightly more dependent on the data set, but usually we don't don't know how to prove anything about those kind of solutions. But Yes, precisely. But let me get back to that kind of, you know, as, as we go through the talk. I'm, I'm confused. In cryptography, you need theorems because if you don't have a theorem, the code can be broken. But here, I mean, it's practically good. Why do you absolutely need a theorem? Uh, there are two reasons. One is that uh, sometimes we do need guarantees, actually. We do want to see that we found everything we could find. That's part one. And part two is that oftentimes it is, think about this as, this is a way to study problems, okay? If we can put a measure uh, on how good are we doing, uh, we can measure progress. Have we moved from one solution to the other? Is it really better? Okay, we can always, you know, perhaps we can go and like code up things and sometimes you will you know, say whether it's better or not. But oftentimes it is, I mean, w what we measure is kind of progress on kind of theoretical ideas, kind of other like fundamentally different ideas or fundamentally different approaches. And the good part about proving something theoretically is also that you can prove lower bounds. And as you'll see kind of in a couple of slides, it also allows us to see where are the bottlenecks and how do we go around these bottlenecks. So it is kind of a more, I don't know, kind of fundamental belief that theoretical study of the subjects is important to come up with new ideas rather than kind of doing kind of incremental improvements by doing heuristics, let's say. But anyways, this is more philosophical topic. Uh, so let me, uh, since I'm kind of uh, uh, slowly running out of time, uh, let me kind of get to a couple more punch points. Um, so. So related to this question is, okay, um, let me think, how, how much time shall I aim for? I see. Okay. So let me, uh, so this was a slide about uh, that there exist other methods for, um, for uh, but there are methods that are uh, work for other spaces like Hemming space and in other applications for, for text data, ask me after the talk. But let me uh, kind of go beyond in a sense, you know, this is in a sense the most recent development in the last few years and I really wanted to highlight it. Uh, so one, one of them is that uh, can we go beyond localized hashing? Kind of, can we go beyond the lower bound that we've seen? And the answer is yes. What we we can get better maps, right? So despite the lower bound, it turns out that we can get better maps if we're allowed. Uh, if those maps are allowed to depend on the data set. Okay. So let me give you a non-example, right? So this is a little bit, you know, related to the point is when we partition the space, but we look at the data set first. And let me give you a non-example first, you know, just to kind of uh, make it a little bit more clear. Um, so one such example that maximally depends on the data set is to define the map of a query point such that uh, it directly says the identity of the closest point uh, of, uh, of so the closest point to the query Q from the data set, right? So this is this is the ideal map. The problem is that computing this function is just as hard as the problem that we started with. Uh, just to give you an analogy, is like, you know you're going to the library, and the librarian tells you, "I'll tell you where to find the origin of species once you are able to recite all possible books in this world." Right? And say, "Okay, you know, at this moment, thank you." You know, I don't really need it then, right? Um, so what turns out that we can do is we can get better, more efficient maps. Uh, we, we can get better and efficient maps if we're allowed to depend on the data set. Okay? And uh, just to kind of numerically compare, um, these are kind of and these are recent results. It will improve over so for clean space. It will improve upon this exponent 
which is a quarter, to exponent which is 1 over 7. OK? And uh, kind of just pictorially to tell you how it looks like, roughly it, it, it follows from two new ideas here. One is that it turns out that certain nice point configurations have better space partitions. And these nice point configurations are pseudo-random point configurations. This is as if the points were distributed randomly, let's say, from Gaussian distribution. OK, so those of you who have seen Avi's talk, and he talked a little bit about pseudo-randomness, think about this as nice point configuration is when it is, just a second, um, when it is pseudo-random. And it turns out that when we are pseudo-random, we can do better space partitions. And uh, point number two is that uh, it turns out that we can always reduce to such configuration. So this part two is a certain uh, is a certain reduction, and for those of you who have heard about the notion, it's a form of regularity lemma, which says that we can take any worst case point set and do certain kind of surgery on it and to reduce it to something that looks uh, nearly random. Okay, question? Uh, not quite, not quite. It is, it, I really mean that it is pseudo-random. For example, this means that most of the vectors are nearly perpendicular to each other. Yeah, it's also the general position, but it's much stronger than the general position, yes. Not quite smooth analysis, more like regularity lemmas. Uh, so it's not quite a regularity lemma. It would be too strong to call it, uh, but it is very related to those ideas. Do you hope to, to improve on the, uh, on the concept of niceness to have a, a more powerful concept there? Excellent question. Uh, no, the bound that we get, we, you know, we can prove it, but this is the best we can do. This. So in a sense, this is, this is the best we can do. Yes, excellent question. Yes. Clement? We do care. We do care about this, and uh, in a sense, you know, I'm not. I'm not going to tell you the details here, uh, but it turns out that you know both parts can be done efficiently. Okay, so it is you know it's a non-trivial point kind of, but they can be done efficiently. Yes, question. Uh, Gaussian distribution. Let's say high-dimensional Gaussian distribution. Of your points, yeah. So the data set is as if it is distributed from a Gaussian distribution. Well, a sample of sam A sample endpoints, yes. I mean, it is a little bit more technical than this. And if it is, it's, not, it's not that we assume that they are random. They are as if they are, they are random. More technical condition is that most points are near, most vectors are near perpendicular to each other. OK. So in high-dimensional space, we can have many vectors. They are nearly perpendicular to each other. If, if we allow, let's say, dot products to be about yeah. epsilon, yeah. then it will be log n by epsilon squared. Let's say we can pack, actually, a lot of points in relatively low-dimensional space. Yes, I mean, I have to talk about kind of epsilons and deltas. And you know, I chose not to talk about them, just kind of to give the ideas, but you know. For the right epsilon is possible. So let me just summarize. Um, so uh, you know, and the main, you know, these were kind of some examples of where kind of similarity search appeared. Um, so the main, the main points of this talk was, you know, kind of to introduce geometry, to use geometric ideas to solve these problems. And in particular, you know, we took objects and we mapped them to high-dimensional vectors. Right? We took uh, the notion of similarity then mapped to distance, or you know, the dissimilarity mapped to distance between vectors. Okay? And then the problem of similarity search, we formalized as nearest neighbor search. Right? And once we've done these kind of steps, you know, we are in the land of geometry. And now, kind of to solve this problem, we use a lot of, kind of geometric ideas. And the, you know, the interesting part is the different applications. Kind of, you know, I showed you mostly pictures. You know, there is, let's say, text or signals. Different applications will require different distances. So there is uh, more, you know, each distance kind of leads to different geometry. And it leads to many, many questions. So it is a class of problems. 
And the nice part is that it connects to kind of rich mathematical uh, areas, in particular functional analysis, uh, through things like space partitions and isoperimetric inequalities. You know, if you remember the question, what is the body of the least perimeter? Um, also, two other questions that I uh, didn't really talk about. These are metric embeddings, how we map some geometries into some other geometries, and what are the bounds or impossibility results there. Um, and it's only recently, you know, as of like two, three years ago, that we really, well, we think at the moment, we understood what is, you know, what happens with linear metric. What are the best algorithms there? And of course, there is a lot more work remaining for many other geometries that appear in different applications. And I'll end here. Thank you. <laughs>